Well, welcome everyone. My name is Doug Brigham, and I'm the chair of the Board of Trustees here at the College of Idaho. And I want to thank everyone for coming out on this glorious sunny day. Uh, I'm sure all of you woke up to the same thing I woke up to this morning, uh, which gave me uh, a little angst uh, thinking about being out here today. But apparently the storm has moved on, and it's a, a wonderful day and a wonderful day to be a, a yote today. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming out. What a great crowd today. And uh, what a great celebration we're going to have here as we break ground on the Cruz and Murray Library. And you think about liberal arts colleges in this country today, and we're all dependent. Uh, we're private, uh, so we're very dependent on the generosity and the goodwill of our alumni and the friends of the college. And as a college, we've not had a more generous uh, gift uh, from individuals than what we're going to announce here today and what is being put forth towards this library. Uh, but without further ado, I want to introduce our president, Dr. Charlotte Borst. Good morning, everyone. Today is a great day at the College of Idaho as we celebrate the groundbreaking from the new Cruzen Murray Library. Few colleges in the United States get to build a brand new library, so we count ourselves enormously blessed by the generous gift that makes this possible. I want to welcome all our guests, our faculty, our staff, our students, alumni, and trustee members. A big welcome to Malcolm Post. Malcolm, would you just wave? Here he is, the executor of Debbie's estate, and to our friends from Caldwell, including uh, Mayor Garrett Nancolas. Garrett, you want to wave? Here he is. And uh, others from the Treasure Valley, welcome and thank you for coming. I'm a historian by background, so of course I always begin remarks with a historical look. And this time is no different. From the medieval period to the 20th century, college and university libraries were built really as massive book storehouses with most space devoted to stacks. This made sense in an era when a library's primary function was to house and to lend books. But the academic library has evolved to become an information center that needs as much space for new technologies and collaborative learning environments as it does for book storage. As students now are becoming more active as creators and producers of knowledge and scholarship, often within a collaborative men or mentored project or program, the challenging question arises, how do these new forms of activity fit within the traditional model of a library as a space for collections and individual, often private individual study. The multiple paradoxes of the current historical movement in the history of uh, college library collection management and development are profound. The arrival of digital collections, e-journals especially, and advanced forms of resource sharing mean that in effect, college libraries can now offer high-level research collections that support various forms of undergraduate research and scholarship. At the same time, due to the shrinking footprint of traditional print collections, college libraries can now explore different ways in which teaching and learning can take place within the physical spaces of the library. The Cruz and Murray Library Plan recognizes that changes in physical space and collections are indeed processes rather than one-time events. The current hybrid nature of monograph and journal literature will continue to evolve, we know. No doubt further toward the digital end of the spectrum, though I can assure you that we will continue to have books in our library. But alterations in physical space need to be flexible in order to accommodate further changes in user needs, collections, and technologies. Our design is not only functional, but beautiful. With the use of glass, 
There will be light-filled spaces that invite users to work in an environment that also, by the way, celebrates sustainability. The idea of sustainability and beauty is further reinforced by the use of native Idaho wood, something Debbie Murray asked the architects to incorporate. But this also celebrates the long heritage of Idaho's leadership as a timber state. I am so excited that we are at the moment to break ground on this new, beautiful library. Michael Vandervelden, our VP for Development, is perhaps the person most responsible for working with Debbie as she contemplated this gift. We owe very much to Michael, and he will now speak about Debbie. Thanks. So Debbie Murray was a trustee of this wonderful college from 1991 until officially 2003. President Hendren, whom she revered, idolized, presided over many of those years. And she and her husband Richard were very close also with Bob's wife Merlin, and they remained close throughout their lives. These were really glorious years, glorious years for Debbie. And like everything she did in her life, she served the college with utmost, utmost dedication, with gusto, with grace. If you haven't had a chance to go over to Blatchley Hall, do so, if only as a gesture of respect to Debbie. Because you'll see as you enter into Blatchley Hall, right there on the right, there's a, a bronze plaque that commemorates her redesign of the hall. You know, she was an interior designer, a published, incredibly talented, and Bob definitely knew what he was doing when he asked her to redesign that hall because it looks magnificent. To give another example of Debbie's incredible dedication to this college, I can't tell you how many times, and I'm looking at Malcolm, I'm sure he's heard, heard the story as well, um, uh, she told me that she was so proud when Bob Hendren asked her to help out with a choir. And uh, he, she wasn't exactly sure what he meant by that, but she went to a couple of the choral performances and she said, you know, Bob, they sound really good, but they look a little bit tattered, you know, a little bit ragged at, at the edges. I think if you would permit me to do this, I'd like to design some coral robes and make them look just as good as they sound. And she did, and she was uh, very proud of that, and she would always tell that story. And Bob, of course, felt so much gratitude, so much gratitude. Now there is, as those, those years indeed were glorious years that Debbie served here on the board, but there's an important fact that I think is often overlooked or not mentioned, and that is her husband, Richard, Richard Murray, played a very important role in all of this as well, of course, and is obviously a key partner in Debbie's incredible gift to the college. But Richard, who was born in Cincinnati and went to Yale as an undergrad and then went into the U.S. Navy and then went to Harvard Law School and then became a partner at, its what, at what is now known as Bingham McCutcheon in San Francisco. He lived a very busy life, had a very professional, um, high profile um, in San Francisco and actually nationally. And yet, and yet, when Debbie would come here to the college to serve as a trustee, he would come with her. <laughs> he would come with her. And the board then, as I, as I think it is still today, was really a who's who of civic and corporate leaders. And he really enjoyed the social interactions with the trustees. He really enjoyed that. He really enjoyed 
spending a lot of time, too, as did Debbie with President Hendren and with Merlin. And I say this, of course, this, these prefatory comments to give you some sense for why we're standing here today. Because these were days that they really felt connected to the institution. They came to really love it. But I think there was another really maybe even more fundamental reason that we're standing here today. And I want to talk about that as well. And it became very clear to me. If, I, if, you, if you'll just bear with me a minute, I'm going to take you back to August of 2006 when I first met Debbie Murray. It was a beautiful, summery Marin County day. I drove north on 101. And my first time meeting her at her house in Ross. And she was very polite, very friendly. Invited me into her house. And she showed me uh, around the house. It was the magnificent Amari porcelain collection that will figure so prominently in the library. And then there were photographs of family members and friends like Malcolm and his sister Catherine and their parents, Therese and Malcolm Sr. And because it was such a beautiful day, we went out onto the deck overlooking what really, and I grew up in the Bay Area, but I've got to tell you, the most panoramically beautiful view of Mount Tamapias. And we didn't sit down. There was a circular table, but we didn't sit down. We just looked out at the mountain. But Debbie didn't talk about the beauty in front of us. What she talked about was her glorious upbringing in Idaho. <laughs> and the days, and I see you smiling at me, Malcolm, because you know how deep inside her this place was. She spent so many wonderful days on the family ranch here in Idaho. And she had so many stories to tell about the work that she did, the chores that she did, the Union Pacific Railroad that, that, that you know, went by her farmland. She just felt so good about it. And then that kind of morphed into a conversation about the College of Idaho and how 75% of our students come from Idaho. And that she knew many of those students. And she talked about one in particular, Doug Axon who was her tennis partner and graduated with her from high school, who would come to the college out of relative poverty. And this college had transformed his life, <laughs> had transformed his life. And he had become really successful in education. And he was just you know, a shining example of what the College of Idaho could do. And she felt it so powerfully inside of her. You know what I mean? It was almost like tears kept welling up how good she felt about this institution. It was a transformative place. And that's the way she always talked about the library in subsequent years, when she settled upon the library as being the gift that she wanted, that she and Richard wanted to give to this institution. She said, you know, a library, it's the hub of the intellectual life of a college, of a university. It's a place where students, community members can come and discover themselves, discover others, discover the past, discover new ideas. It was a transformative place. That's the way she viewed it. And that's what she, she and Richard wanted to achieve. In closing, I want to say one other thing about Debbie. Debbie was a person who loved to celebrate life. <laughs> she loved to celebrate life. <laughs> There was no occasion too small that she wouldn't want to celebrate it. Friends, graduations, birthday parties, every single holiday, if you went to her house, there were decorations like crazy. Um, she would throw parties and have party favors. She just was full of the joy of life. And I just think it's fitting that we should all be here today to celebrate what Richard and Debbie together have done for this college to make this kind of a transformative gift that will change the lives of students, of community members, of friends of the college for years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael. We now 
can turn our attention to the shovel crew. Those of you who are assigned, um, can we take our place? Ready? All right. <laughs> 